So I was sitting around thinking about potatoes, as one does, and I realized that hidden deep inside these brown tubers was something that I want. Starch. Not for any real reason, though. I only wanted to see if I could extract it because I thought it would be fun, which, as it turns out, it really was. I also really enjoy the process of taking something otherwise plain or ordinary and turning it into something beautiful. And as you might already expect, there is some beautiful chemistry you can do with this stuff. On that note, today I'm going to show you how you can extract starch from potatoes using things you probably already have at home. And yes, you could absolutely just buy starch at a store, but where's the fun in that? This is a potato. Plain unassuming, and quite ordinary. They're mostly made of water, but if you look at the biochemistry of a potato, the most abundant and readily extractable compound they contain is the complex carbohydrate starch. That's what I'm after, but what is starch really? From a practical perspective, starch is simply an energy storage molecule like fat for a plant. From a technical perspective, however, starch is composed mostly of two primary molecules, amylose and amylopectin. These are both glucose polymers where the individual glucose monomers are connected by glycosidic bonds. When the one carbon of one glucose molecule bonds to the four carbon of another, you get either lactose or maltose. Lactose occurs when the hydroxyl group on the anomeric carbon points up out of the plane of the ring in what's called a beta linkage. However, when it points down in an alpha linkage, we instead get maltose. When enough glucose molecules form more and more alpha-1,4 linkages together, this eventually results in a big insoluble polymer chain called amylose. As a side note, if the same thing happens in the beta-1,4 orientation, you get cellulose. Unlike amylose, cellulose is indigestible, and it's pretty much for the same reason that so many people have a problem digesting lactose, in that we didn't really evolve enzymes designed to break 1,4 glycosidic bonds. Anyway, the other main component of starch amylopectin is very similar to amylose, except that some alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonding occurs, and this somewhat alters the properties of the molecule. At this point, you've probably had enough with the theory, so let's go ahead and get started. To get started extracting starch from this potato, I began by peeling a potato to remove all the skin. The skin doesn't contain any starch, and I felt like it would only discolor my product. I then used a grater to shred the potato into smaller pieces, although this was honestly not my first idea. In my first attempt at this process, I tried to instead blend the potato into a uniform slurry. However, this method completely failed, as I couldn't find any practical way to separate the extremely small potato particles from the starch granules. This problem could likely be solved by some sort of complex centrifugation technique, but as far as DIY methods go, I'd stick to the grater. Anyway, I next transferred all my grated potato to a beaker, and then filled it all the way up with distilled water. I then aggressively stirred the potato mixture, and this was done to try and dislodge the starch granules from the plant material. As an extra step that's honestly probably a bit overkill, I next decided to sonicate this for a half hour. As a quick side note, I did try this whole process again a second time later with no sonication, and my yield per gram of potato was 22% lower. So it does seem like this step does make a difference if you happen to have a sonicator lying around. Anyway, after 30 minutes in the sonicator, the potato mixture was poured through a steel strainer, allowing most of the starch to pass through while holding back most of the potato slurry. I then returned the potato mess to the beaker and repeated the process to try and extract as much potato starch as possible. Now that I had effectively separated my starch from the raw plant material, I allowed the mixture to sit around for about an hour. During this time, all of the starch granules settled to the bottom where they collected into a thick layer. This allowed the dirty water to be easily decanted off without losing any significant amount of my starch. The dirty water was replaced with new distilled water mixed thoroughly and then the process repeated two more times to try and get my starch as clean as possible. After the third and final rinsing, I collected the starch in my Buchner funnel, gave it a quick final rinse with ethanol, and then transferred the pure product to my watch glass to dry. 
When I came back the next day, my potato starch had dried completely, and so I weighed it for a final mass of 19.53 grams. The potato I started with weighed 245 grams, meaning I collected about 8% of its total mass as starch. This may not sound like a lot, but given that over 80% of a potato's mass is water, it really means that the dry weight recovery here is really 39.9%. Considering that 60 to 80% of a potato's dry mass is starch, this is certainly far from a perfect method. That said, was this all practical? And um, I would have to say not really, but was it fun? I would say yes. However, potato starch can be very difficult to find at most grocery stores in the US, and this really isn't something you can simply substitute with cornstarch. This is because cornstarch is far higher than potato starch in fats and proteins. This obviously makes a difference in cooking, but more importantly, it makes a difference in doing practical chemistry. To explain how, I first need to talk a little bit about how you can use starch in the chemistry lab. Most often, starch is used as an indicator in ideometric titration. The idea here is that starch will form a deep blue complex with the triiodide ion, which is produced in mixtures containing both iodide and free iodine. This color disappears when the mixture is reduced and all the free iodine is converted to iodide. While triiodide does have a distinct yellow color of its own, the blue produced in the presence of starch is a lot more intense, making the end point of a titration a lot easier to spot. Starch is also required for the iodine clock reaction as well as the oscillating clock, both of which take advantage of this blue complex for their stunning displays. Now, the problem with using cornstarch for any of this is that it tends to be very cloudy when dissolved in water due to all the extra fat and protein. Potato starch, on the other hand, dissolves a lot more cleanly and so is far preferable for these type of lab uses. As a final little demo, I thought it would be cool to try and look at the blue starch triiodide complex under the microscope. To do this, I first tried dissolving some of the potato starch in boiling water, and then adding a few drops of Lugol's iodine. I then transferred a single drop of this to a microscope slide and gave it a look. As you can see, the blue stained granules of starch are deformed and swollen, and this is what happens when starch quote unquote dissolves in hot water. Here you can see the plain, dry starch granules at 40 times magnification, and you can clearly see that the compound is actually composed of very well-ordered granules that are insoluble and will not swell or deform in cold water. As I zoom further and further in, it becomes clear that the individual granules are of very irregular size and shape, which I'm guessing was simply exacerbated by the boiling water. Anyway, I did try adding some Lugol's iodine to the granules here, but the blue color was really only apparent at moderate concentrations. At high concentrations of iodine, it really made the granules look like little black balls in a sea of yellow, which I guess looked interesting in its own way. In any case, that's really all I have for today. If you liked watching me do completely unnecessary things in a very elaborate way, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know in the comments if you'd like to see me do more videos like this one. As always, I want to give a big thank you to my members here on YouTube for your support, as it's critical in funding all the work I do here. To everyone else, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.